still give myself a cube, but in this case, maybe the cube, okay, so let's say the cube is two dimensional, and you know, I, I'll try to do the same story again on the faces of a cube, okay? And here, for instance, uh, there is something that I can do, is pick a new center on this face, like here, okay? And whatever, so the image was contained in the boundary, and now in this face of a boundary, what I will do is I will push points I will project uh, radially in this direction, and in this direction I will get one point. Here I cannot really do that, so you know I'll keep uh, better. Usually uh, when I continue, I continue on all the faces, or not on all of the faces, but in my picture uh, I do it step by step. Again, here there is not much I can do, but here, again, I can pick any point here, project on that point, and forget about the point there. Okay, so let me try to read my slide and see whether I'm missing important information. So you start from your initial cube, you start with a inside of a cube, you try to find a center which is not on the set, you project from the center, and you get a new image. So I guess this is what I call pi m here. And I get a new image which is in the union of the faces of a cube which I call the skeleton of dimension one less, okay? Once I'm finished with this, I have a new set which is lying on the faces of dimension, uh, in this case, n minus one. Uh, if n minus one is large enough compared, for instance, with the dimension d that I'm thinking about all the time, then I know that in, in each face, uh, I mean, what I didn't say before is that the image is still d-dimensional, we cost of measure finite, so you never cover a face. So if you pick a point near the center of each face, you can reproject on faces of dimension n minus two, and you get a new set, uh, so a new projection which is just composing two projections, and a new set which is the image, which still has a host of measure under control, and which is contained in the skeleton of dimension n minus two. And you continue like this, uh, at some point of time, you hit the dimension d, okay? And then two things can happen. In general, you hit the dimension d and you have a projection on the faces of dimension d, and you're stuck. And you're not going to be able to find anything better. In some cases, you're lucky. It just turns out that each of the face, uh, that the measure of a set is still so small that it never covers half a, a face. So you will be able to find a red point like here in every small face of dimension d. And then you can project once more the set onto a skeleton of dimension d minus one. And for me, it's essentially as if I made the set disappear. So I'm even especially happy in this case. Any, okay, and uh, so this is probably one of the cases where you shouldn't look at the slide because, uh, yeah, okay. So that's the basic Federer Fleming projection iterated up to the faces of dimension d, maybe d minus one if you're lucky and you had holes. Okay, step number three, uh, we uh, do that on a bunch of cubes. Uh, so why would you care doing it on a bunch of cubes? It's because uh, here uh, on the boundary of this cube we've been moving points around. But uh, remember, we'll have to construct competitors of deformation subsets. And the deformation subset, there is a place where the thing has to be the identity. So it's not so clear to me that I should be able to move points on the boundary. So I'll put a caution between what I like to do, which is do the full Federer Fleming projection, and what I can actually do, which is a full Federer Fleming projection most of the time and uh, change it a little bit near the boundary, okay? So I still give myself a big cube, okay? Uh, which I think I'll call Q. I give myself a large number N. Uh, taking the number N large will allow me to make some uh, errors small, okay? And I cut 
my cube into uh, n to the power little n the dimension cubes. I will leave it as an exercise to find out whether my horizontal n is the same as my vertical n. It's improbable, but anyway, let's imagine it's like this. So I cut this cube into equal cubes, n to the power little n of m. Okay, and what do I do in each of these cubes here? I do the complete Federer-Fleming projection on each of those cubes here. Okay. One thing that I, I didn't say, or I mean, it was written maybe, but I didn't say, is that once you do the Federer-Fleming projection on the on the face, it is the identity on the boundary of a face, so you can extend it to be the identity uh, everywhere else, right? Which means that my Federer-Fleming projections glue to each other very nicely, right? So here, when I'm saying I'm doing the Federer-Fleming projection here, so let me try to see what happens. Uh, so here I'm taking risks. Okay. Uh, there are cubes which don't contain anything, and those for those things, things are easier. Let's say for this one, which is uh, easy, also I take a C somewhere in the middle, and I will project my green thing in on the face, and I will get something like this. Okay, and let's say here I will have another point, and I will project on something like this, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, here, I would be probably projecting here, but I could project on the other side. Let's say here I will take a center like this, and I will project there. Uh, I would project there. Okay, yeah, and so on. Okay, I don't do the rest, you imagine what happens, okay? And then uh, here the set was of dimension one, so in principle I should stop. And again, if I'm lucky, like in this face, uh, if I was lucky in all the faces like this, I would be able to push it to a point and I would be even happier, okay? Now, the reason why I decided to, so on the inside here, you do the full Federer Fleming projection, uh, but when you're here, you are a little bit more ca uh, cautious because, for instance, on the boundary here, you want the identity. Okay? So I'll tell you exactly what I do in this uh, cube here. So on this cube here, it is not contained in the boundary of Q, so I still feather a Fleming project. And I will get this part here. This face here is still not contained in the boundary, so I'm allowed to project on it, uh, except that I can't, but uh, you know, if there was a hole, I would project on it. So for instance, this face here, I can, you know, maybe if there was a, a tiny bit here, so I would be able to project in this direction, that would be fine, okay? But on this face here, which is contained in the boundary, I decide I cannot touch and things anymore because I want the identity anyway, so I will not move points in in the middle, okay? That's the whole story. And again, it's designed so that, I mean, this is the danger uh, region which I, I will be a little bit afraid of. On this region, I don't know exactly what I'm doing, uh, but, uh, you know, I hope it's not going to be too important in the estimates. And inside, I do really what I like, okay? Still no problem about this? Okay. I mean, since we're using this Fenner Fleming projection all the time, it's better. If, and uh, again, I did my, I mean, usually I try to do pictures in 3D, but it's not clear. It's always uh, working better. All right. So let's try to use it, and let's try to do Alphos regularity, the upper bound on a set of large co-dimension, okay, the, where we stopped uh, last time. Okay, so we have uh, an almost minimal set. We start, instead of working on the ball, we work on a cube. It doesn't matter so much for the estimate, so we take this large cube, Q0. The cube Q0 we cut into, and we suppose that there is a lot of mass here uh, on Q0. Uh, we cut a Q0 uh, into pieces. I don't recognize what I was supposed to do. Uh, Okay, well, anyway, it will come back. So I draw this picture, 
with a large n to be chosen later. I suppose that I have a lot of mass in there. And again, in this part here, I project up to the end. And there, I project not uh, up to the end. And since it's uh, deformations, I get a competitor for my initial set in Q0. It's the identity, so it stays the same outside of Q0. <coughs> and then I try to estimate the measure of a competitor in Q0. All right? OK, so let's try. The competitor is composed of, uh, so, so what I wrote here still, I mean, so before I make the uh, slide disappear, is I have this new competitor, I call it G. F was the inside of E in the, the intersection of E with uh, Q0. And the almost minimality of my set says exactly the thing that I numbered 13, which is host of measure of a set inside Q0 is less than host of measure of a competitor, G, inside Q0, plus a small error. Would you remember? So, and again, F is more or less the same as E, and G is my competitor. And I go to the next slide, okay? So again, G is composed of two pieces, the piece that lies in here and the piece that lies on the dangerous annulus there, and we'll have to estimate their measure separately. And I start with the thing that I really wanted, which is this part here. So this part, what I know is that the uh, set is contained in the skeleton of dimension D of the union of all my cubes, and I have a very brutal estimate up there, it's less than, of a measure is less than C times, the number of little cubes times the measure of a skeleton of each little cube. So it looks, the scaling is delta, so delta is the size of a, of a cube, okay, of a uh, small cube. It sounds bad because there is an n to the power n minus d, but don't worry about that, it's a constant. I will choose n, it's, a, it's going to be a very large number, but essentially, I get a bounded a contribution from inside, okay? What's happening outside? So what's happening outside is I have to estimate the measure of the image, okay? My federal Fleming projections have a property that's once you're in a cube, you can move inside the cube, in the boundary of a cube, but you stay in the cube. So if I want to estimate the measure inside this outer layer, the only thing that I have to do is I take each of the cubes here, I look at what happens to my federal Fleming projection, uh, I find out that at each stage uh, I multiply maybe the measure by constant c, there is a certain number of stages, so in each cube I multiply the measure by some constant, okay? So e essentially what I'm saying is that the measure that I have here in the image is less than c times the measure that I had before uh, in the points that uh, appear. And just to be on the safe side, uh, there is a second layer that I remove. Uh, okay, uh, I remove it uh, to be on the safe side because maybe points of this cube will end up on this boundary and I want it to include the measure of the boundary. Okay, so something like this. So this is uh, what's happening here. I have uh, Q2 is Q0 minus the two outside layers. It's still very small. A, uh, the annulus, will be the difference between the big cube and the smaller cube. So it's the annular region which has just width two, okay, which is very small. And the estimate for the part uh, of a competitor that lives in here is less than C times the measure that I had in the annulus. Okay, and in principle, I have this estimate up there on the slide. Let me check. Uh, so G minus Q1 is less than C times hot of measure of what I had in the annulus. Okay, so I put all my estimates together. I remember I have that the measure of E was less than the measure of a competitor plus something small. The measure of a competitor has two pieces, the one inside the grid, which is bounded, the one on the exterior, which is bounded in terms of what happened on the annulus. And I get something like this, which is host of measure inside the cube, is less than a uh, large number but controlled, 
host of measure uh, inside the annulus plus small error. Okay. I assumed that the uh, oh sorry yes this plus this is very small compared to the total amount of mass that I had before because this was my assumption. I said start assuming that there is a lot of mass inside. So I write it like this, like one half of this plus that. And what I get at the end is that this quantity here is controlled by the quantity in the annulus. Okay? That's what I have here. So that's what I get, okay? It's not, I mean, what would be beautiful would have been if you didn't have uh, this measure of the annulus. Uh, the measure of the annulus comes from the fact that we have to glue something uh, and it's unpleasant. However, n is very large, so here I am in a situation where I have a uh, host of measure in the whole uh, cube, less than uh, some constant times host of measure in a very, very, very thin annulus. And I'm saying this, this sounds fishy, okay? Especially since I can't control who is my cube, Q0. So the, the picture that I should draw is more like this, right? This is my annulus. And I get the conclusion that if I had lots of mass in there, then in fact something like 10% of the mass was on the inside annulus. Okay. The standard way to continue the argument is to say, okay, this looks like a differential inequality, saying that the mass inside here is uh, less than uh, uh, is uh, less than some amount uh, times the derivative of that mass, getting a differential inequality and proving that actually the mass inside decays extremely fast and in fact there is nothing in the middle. Uh, another way to say this is that once you have this, so 10% are gone, and you can start the same argument with a square which is uh, and a new annulus here. Okay, and again, 10 more percent will go away, and you iterate. Uh, you find out that when you iterate, you can even take annuli, so annuli that are smaller and smaller, and at the end, you get that this part here was empty or had some control, okay? So the truth is that I'm saying all those things to convince you that once we have the estimate up there, we're in business. But I don't want to be more precise than that because it's just playing uh, games. And the right way I claim to play the game is to choose your initial cube Q0 correctly at the first place and get the contradiction immediately. And again, the hint for choosing the best Q0 at the beginning would be take the cube, which is, I think, is as large as possible with a huge density, and then if it was as large as possible, uh, you get the contradiction immediately. Okay? I, I don't want to do this because first I always get confused, and again, I think the important information is here, right? You should not expect that most of the mass is near the boundary. Okay? Great. Sorry about, uh, so this is the, but the rest of the proof is uh, more or less. Okay. One more argument. Uh, so lower r force regularity, which means the lower bound. So the lower bound, I announced to you that it looked like it was harder because you see less why the set should not be allowed to be too thin. At the same time, no, now here is the reason why the set should not be too thin, okay? So again, start with this thing here, and imagine that actually the host of measure of the set was very small inside this cube. You do the federer fleming projection, and you find out that in each cube, the measure that you started with was small, it's multiplied by at most a constant. So at the end, it's still going to be small. If it's very small, it means that no face of dimension D of my grid will be completely filled by my set, okay? By the image that I construct. That's good, that's exactly the condition where I said that I could iterate the construction once more, okay? And in fact, project on a skeleton of dimension D minus one. Okay, let me repeat what I've been doing. I've been assuming this time, so uh, again, n is given to me. I assume that the, the measure of a set in the cube 
is extremely small, depending on n. I do my initial federer Fleming projection the usual way, and I find out that the measure of the image is still extremely small, so small that it cannot contain the full face of dimension d. Then I do it once more, and I can project. So whatever I project here will be on a skeleton of dimension d minus 1, which means I essentially made the set vanish. Okay, That's the inside estimate. As usual, there is uh, an annulus here. In this annulus here, what I do is I essentially multiply measure by constant, and uh, we'll have to do an estimate about that. Okay, Let me see if the estimates that I have here sort of fit. So in principle, I explained the story about this. The host of measure of a projection is always very small, so you can do one more federal Fleming projection. This time, uh, we get this competitor G, and the competitor G is contained inside in a D minus one dimensional part, uh, skeleton, which doesn't count, uh, plus the uh, part that lives on annulus, and the part that lives on an annulus will control the same way as we did before, okay? So what we get is host of measure of the set in Q0, less than host of measure of a competitor plus small error, so that's the same thing as the last time. And this time, this measure here, there is nothing from the grid inside, so you're just left with the part that was living on an annulus plus uh, something small. And on the next page, I have, so it's the same estimate I, as I had before. It's simpler because there is lost, because there is one less term, okay? So you get this thing here. And again, I claim this looks fishy because, you, again, you have uh, something like 10% of the mass of a cube which has to be lying on a thin annulus. Okay? So now the way we say this cannot happen is by reverse uh, uh, engineering. I think I will not even uh, read the whole story. Uh, so let me try to say uh, how you do it. So you start from a cube where the density is extremely small. Okay? And instead of trying to see what happens on that cube and continuing, what you'll do is you say, okay, let's replace this cube where the density is very small by the first cube. So you try the half of a cube, half of a cube, and so on and so forth. And you stop the first time the density starts becoming a little larger. Okay? So this way you get a cube where the density is very, very small, but on half the cube the density is a little bit larger. Uh, in fact, now the second thing that you can do is by pigeonholing or something like this, you find out that you, in the middle between this cube and that cube, I mean the very small and the not so small, uh, you will find another cube for which the annulus here has very, very small measure by averaging, okay? So maybe this, on this one I was unlucky, but here I can arrange that the measure is large, which means that this thing here does not happen, okay? Uh, I'm just missing one thing, which I, uh, in the argument, you could say yes, but in fact, what, hap and what, what, what this proves is essentially I start with this cube with very, very low density, I try to find the first cube where the density gets larger, and in fact, I don't, because all the cubes have low densities uh, starting from this point, okay? And then I uh, appeal to a little bit of a geometric measure theory, not so hard, uh, because at e almost every point of a set, the upper density uh, of a set is strictly positive. It's even larger than some constant that we know of, okay? So this is one thing that's, okay, so anyway, you take, again, you take a set with strictly positive Hausdorff measure. At almost every point of this point, uh, this set, the measure of small balls, uh, you can find small balls centered at this point, where the density is larger than uh, some constant that depends on the dimension. Or maybe it's even one if you normalize things correctly, okay? So here it means that if I started from a cube here that I just centered on one of those points of densities, okay, uh, when I do my attempt of trying to find a cube where the density is large, I will manage, right? Because there are cubes that are as small as I want, 
where the density is large. So if I start from low, very low density, there will be a point where I get density which is very small but not so small, okay? And that's the way it contributes. Again, so in this case, I made a small attempt to tell you, again, the story is that as long as you have a thing up there, you're in good shape. And here I try to make an attempt to, yeah, uh, to tell you how it works. So this was, okay. So this was Alphors regularity. And I think I'd better stop if I don't want, yeah, trouble. <laughs>